First book of Kings, chapter 3, verses 5 through 12. At the beginning of this book, uh, well, Solomon has just received the kingship from his father, King David, and he is seeking direction on how to proceed and be a good king for the people of Israel. So he knows he has big shoes to fill following in his father David's footsteps, and he has an opportunity when the Lord appears to him in a dream on those first uh, nights uh, that he is king, and God asks him a question, and that is where our reading picks up this morning. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I should give you. And Solomon said, You have shown great and steadfast love to your servant, my father David, because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart toward you. And you have kept for him this great and steadfast love, and have given him a son to sit on his throne today. And now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David, although I am only a little child. I do not know how to go out or how to come in. And your servant is in the midst of the people whom you have chosen, a great people, so numerous that they cannot be numbered or counted. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, able to discern between good and evil, for who can govern this, your great people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. And God said to him, Because you have asked this, and have not asked for yourself long life or riches, or for the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right. I now do according to your word. Indeed, I give you a wise and discerning mind. No one like you has been before you, and no one like you shall arise after you. And so ends the reading of God's word. Will you pray with me? O oh God, May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Ask what I should give you. Ask what I should give you. Could you imagine God, King of all kings and Lord of all lords, Prince of Peace, with whom all things are possible, asking you this question? For one, it appears to mean that we have found favor with God. Secondly, God has given us the freedom to ask God for anything. And it's not exactly the freedom to discover every working of the universe and the true nature of reality, but it is an unthinkable opportunity. We can ask ourselves, what would you ask of God? Some would probably be driven to ask God for answers to questions that have plagued humanity for millennia. They are well-intentioned as we wonder why good people suffer, why the world is not willing to believe, and why we cannot even solve problems in our own backyard. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon in the book of Judges, saying, The Lord is with you, sending Gideon off on his mission to be the next judge of Israel, Gideon responded, But sir, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his wonderful deeds that our ancestors recounted to us? In the words of Jennifer Schult in a prayer of a daily book of meditations in Our Daily Bread, 
Uh, she writes that God did not answer that question, why has all this happened to us? But after Gideon had endured seven years of enemy attacks, starvation, and hiding in caves, God did not explain why he never intervened. He could have explained uh, Israel's past sin as the reason, as Israel had faith in God and they moved away after a time and then forgot what the... the um, the miracles that God did for them and then move back when they were punished and all that. But he did not give the past and the moving away from God as the reason. But he gave Gideon hope for the future. That was the focus, the hope for the future. And God said, go with the strength that you have and I will be with you and you will destroy the Midianites. Now, I like Gideon because he asks God this question. It's a question that many of us would ask all the time. God does not give him the answer that he sought, but God answers Gideon in a different way. Do not focus on what you cannot change and what has already happened, but on your future relationship with God. We can ask ourselves not why did this happen, but what can we do now? from here to be better servants of God. I began running in 2016, inspired by my roommate that year in college who was a runner. And he had run at least a mile or more a day for seven and a half years, which is a lot. And he ran his first marathon that May uh, last year. And he inspired me to start um, to start running to get exercise and many other uh, reasons, but also I was in the Frisbee team, so to build up endurance uh, seemed like a good reason, so I just started to run a little bit. And I started running every day, and I gradually started building up the mileage. And as I grew more comfortable with running, I also realized that I could probably attempt to run a marathon. And I ran my first 26.2 miles on June 11th of this year, and on August 31st of this year, I will complete my first year of running a mile or more a day. Now, I run because it is a great way to get exercise, and it also has shown me views from surrounding areas at college and at home around the town of Milford here that I wouldn't have gotten otherwise. I've ran up, and up the entire coastline of Milford now, which I may not have done uh, had I not had an excuse to go explore the coastline of Milford. And it's great to see things uh, from a different perspective. Now, it is known that a lot of training goes into preparing for a marathon. There are countless hours of building up the miles to be prepared, and it is a huge time commitment. Juggling school and other commitments, it was difficult some days to run the full mileage that my training told me to. I could try to make it up, but the article that went along with my training told me not to, just to move on uh, and run the uh, pace, or run what the uh, next day told us to do. And it's true that almost every runner will fall off the training pace at one point or another, but the difference between the runners who start training and do not cross the finish line and the runners who come so far and cross the ultimate finish line is how they compensate for those missed miles. Do not give up when you feel that you have not trained enough in running and in faith, but give yourself the right mind to keep training, to keep moving forward. Do not get discouraged by the miles that have not been run yet, by all that we have yet to learn to be good servants of God and all the miles that have not been run. We do not focus on that, but on what is still to come in the improvement sense, not what we cannot change, but on finishing what we started. Now, at mile 17 during that marathon, I had to stop running because I was having some discomfort, and I was disappointed. I had run a 21-mile run to prepare and had been absolutely fine during that, but I kept moving forward to finish, even at the slow pace that walking is combining a walk and a light jog to eventually reach the goal of finishing. And faith, in a way, is like a marathon. There is no reason to ever stop running toward the finish line, or at least moving toward the finish line. 
While running for that long, I think it is better to think about running two or three miles at a time than the 20 miles left to go ahead of you. And the gift that I can ask of God, or one of the many uh, that I can think of, is the motivation to keep on running, both actual running and moving forward in faith, past the, um, past the first finish line in the marathon, uh, past just one, and past the satisfaction that I've been an inspiration to one person, to be able to fall and get right back up again, to stay positive and be a friend to others. I like who I am, but I have a constant desire to try to be a better friend, to be more understanding, to preach in a way that will be rewarding for people, to be able to convince others that God is loving, powerful, and good, and that God's path is the best path to live a long and healthy life. We can focus on how you can bring others up, because, because it is difficult to change the ways that the world can bring others down. You and I can be those people who give others a reason to smile and to hope from here forward. We can ask God for answers so that we are satisfied. We can ask God for gifts to better our own being and satisfaction. We can ask God for our job back or to help us finish that race. We can ask God to help others. These are good things to ask for if they are not only for ourselves. We ask God to be with us so that we are strong enough to be a loving Christian for others. We will fall out of our training every so often, but we will get back up and keep moving forward, alive with God's hope for us, not brought down by the past, but enriched by the evidence in the Bible that God is powerful. Prophets wrote down their accounts so that all the world would know of God's power. Joshua chapter 4 addressed people like Gideon who had not seen God's wonders with their own eyes and would doubt God's presence with them. It reads, Those twelve stones which they had taken out of the Jordan, Joshua set up in Gilgal, saying to the Israelites, When your children ask your parents, Ask their parents in time to come, what do these stones mean? Then you shall let your children know, Israel crossed over the Jordan here on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan for you until you crossed over. As the Lord your God did to the Red Sea as well, which he dried up for us until we crossed over. So that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty, and so that you may fear the Lord your God forever. Not just then, but forever. And if we remember God's power and praise God with it, we will be strong. We can have confidence that God will give us what we need to move forward. We can have confidence that God will give us what we need to be an ear and an encouragement to others. Solomon asked for wisdom. First, he recognized all that God had done before him. Solomon said, You have shown great and steadfast love to your servant, my father David, because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart toward you, and you have kept for him this great and steadfast love and have given him a son to sit on his throne today. He recognized both the reason good things happen to David and God's praiseworthy love. Solomon showed his thankfulness to God and he also recognized his limitations. And now, O oh Lord, my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David. Although I am only a little child, I do not know how to go out or how to come in. He recognizes that he is limited. He's probably a little bit nervous going into being a king. And he calls himself limited, a little child, as if he is afraid of what is to come, and 
he recognizes that because he has this limitation, he also has this need to ask of God. And he says, your servant is in the midst of the people whom you have chosen, a great people so numerous that they cannot be numbered or counted. He is God's servant, and he is leader over and for a lot of people. So he determines his need. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, able to discern between good and evil, for who can govern this your great people? Not Solomon, but God is that who, who can govern the great people. So Solomon does not thrive on gaining something for himself, only for himself, but on gaining something for himself only so that he can help others. Solomon looked into the past for one thing, to thank God. From there, he looked into the future, wondering how he could become a better servant of God. So we can have our own thanks for God looking into the past. I can thank you, God, for this church in which I have grown up and their everlasting support throughout the years. Thank you, God, for each morning that I have had a reason to wake up with a smile on my face. Thank you for each day. Thank you for the Boy Scout camp that I work at, uh, where I have met many great scouts and scouters, where I will be heading back for six of seven weeks after this service. And thank you for the church and the school friends that I met while at college in Albany. Thank you for my family and for my life experiences that have helped me to become a better person. Our struggles in life are not, are not to bring us down, but to work on, becoming, work on giving us a better experience so that we can grow as individuals, so we can grow our character. And if we focus on that positive side, the good side of the story, then we can move forward with continual hope. We have a lot to thank God for. We may not have seen God part the Red Sea, but we have a lot of our own experiences to show us that God is powerful and that God is loving. The bad side of the world is there, but we can be comforted by the knowledge that that is not the full story. I am definitely not going to be a new king like Solomon, but I can draw parallels, and we all can draw parallels to this story on a similar scale. As I was reading this passage, I thought of how, how Solomon was going to be leading his people, and I can compare it to how I will be leading on a smaller scale, hopefully, a congregation someday after I finish my Master in Divinity degree. I might be able to count the members of the church, but I cannot count the people outside the walls of the church to who our influence hopefully reaches. I want to ask for the same gift, an understanding mind, because that is a very important part of a pastor's job, to understand the people, not just to be a figure uh, in front of the congregation every week, just like Solomon didn't want to just be a king figure removed from everyone else but with the people, present with the people. And this understanding mind, this ability to discern between what is good and what is evil is a very important part of understanding each other as Christians. And Solomon knew this, to ask for this gift from God. With God's help, we can be God's servant, for God is the only one who can govern God's people, and then we become God's servants. We can each pray to God to help us to help others. God was pleased that Solomon did not ask for himself long life or riches or the life of his enemies. Because God is love. Christianity is love. It is our passion to care for others more than for ourselves. We can pray that we can understand each other using strength from God. 
I said that faith is like a marathon. I want to read for you another daily devotional written by Jennifer Schult, which I think illustrates this very well. For three consecutive years, the author's son participated in a piano recital. The last year he played, the author watched him mount steps and set up his music. He played two songs and then sat down next to the author and whispered, Mom, this year the piano is smaller. I said, no, it's the same piano you played last year. You're bigger. You've grown. And she continues, spiritual growth, like physical growth, often happens slowly over time. It is an ongoing process that involves becoming more like Jesus. And it happens as we are transformed through the renewing of our minds. When the Holy Spirit is at work in us, we may become aware of sin in our lives. Wanting to honor God, we make an effort to change. Sometimes we experience success, but other times we try and we fail. It seems like nothing changes and we get discouraged. We may equate failure with a lack of progress, when it's often proof that we are in the middle of the process. Spiritual growth, she continues, involves the Holy Spirit, our willingness to change and time. There's three items leads to spiritual growth. And at certain points in our lives, we may look back and see that we have grown spiritually because of the Holy Spirit, our willingness to change and time. May God give us the faith to continue to believe that he who began a good work in us will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus, which are Paul's words in Philippians. God will carry us on to completion. We may be at places uh, where we, or we may experience limitations and failures, but we know that we are still growing and we can still get there with God's help. And that is what we can focus on. And that is what Solomon also focused on. Our failure at certain things is not the full story. There is more to come. If the finish line of all the marathons in the world was the point at which humans can be as close to Jesus as we can imagine, the start line can be where we decide to center our lives on God. There may be many of those points. And when we run, we are making effort to change, wanting to honor God. When we are overcome by some discomfort and are forced to slow our pace or to walk, we get discouraged. But we know to keep moving forward at a pace that is sometimes unrecognizable in our spiritual life, yet it is still happening. And we can still be comforted by the knowledge that it still, ha that it still happens as we realize when we cross the finish line. Remember how discouraged we were in the middle of it. But we recognize the progress that we made at the end of it. We have to trust that God will continue to help us to move forward because God finishes what God starts. God will give us what we ask for if we do so in the right spirit. Achieving the spirit is challenging, but all we can work, all we can do is work towards it and make progress. And we will make progress with God's help. I received a chain email from one of my friends at the Albany Church last month. And this was the good kind of chain email because it was about faith. And I particularly enjoyed two sayings included in that. The first read, when God solves our problems, we have faith in his abilities. When God doesn't solve our problems, he has faith in our abilities. The second, life without God is like an unsharpened pencil. It has no point. Now God had faith in Gideon's strength because that strength was based on faith. We talk so much about how we need to adjust and feed our faith in God, but we need to remember that we are constantly on a two-way street. God has faith in us too. God had faith in Solomon when God asked him what he wanted from God. God trusted that he would ask for the right gift and that God could reward him. Let us keep our part of the conversation with God, relying on God's abilities to help us along our path and also on our abilities to keep trying, to never give up. 
Soon enough, all of our discouragement will turn into an everlasting joy, thankful for the progress that we realize that we made. I have heard many people telling me or another in real life, in movies or somewhere, you just don't understand. In 1 Samuel 13, the new king Saul waits for Samuel to offer the burnt offering, but he is late and an army of Philistines is approaching. Now, the new king Saul wants to offer this offering to please God before the battle happens so that God is with them throughout the battle, but the Philistines are approaching and Samuel, the prophet, has not yet appeared to offer the burnt offering. So Saul explained, when I saw that the people were slipping away from me, and that you, Samuel, did not come within the days appointed, and that the Philistines were mustering at Mi'kmash, I said, Now the Philistines will come upon me at Gilgal, and I have not entreated the favor of the Lord. So I forced myself, and I offered the burnt offering. Now Samuel said to Saul when he showed up, You have done foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. The Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever, but now your kingdom will not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart, and the Lord has appointed him to be ruler over his people, because you have not kept what the Lord has commanded. Now Saul's action may have been what any of us would have resorted to during that time period for the fear of the oncoming Philistine army and the people turning away from him him during that time. Time was of the essence here. He could have been thinking when Samuel was saying these things to him, you just don't understand. But he went away quietly. A friend told me that the person he, that he had just treated rudely didn't deserve respect. And when I tried to argue the point, he told me, you just don't understand. He's right. I know nothing about their prior relationship. I'm just trying to understand both sides in the mix of what could be a lack of forgiveness, a series of misinterpretations or hurt feelings. Many times an understanding ear is what an agitated person needs to open one's mind and tell someone that you understand where they are coming from and you really do can help to create some sense of peace. Maybe, just maybe, in that sense of peace, that person will understand more from others' perspectives as well. So God give us this to help ourselves and to help each other live with that extra sense of peace. Next time God calls to us, we can focus on the future. We can see not how far we have to go, but on how far we have come thankful for the struggles that we overcome and, hope, and hopeful for improvement to follow. We are God's servants, relying on God as we spread God's word, the bread of life. We can tell God, here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling in the night. I will go, Lord, if you lead me. I will hold your people in my heart, if only you give me an understanding mind. Thanks be to God. Amen.